Hello again. Now I hadn't seen workload like this ever in my decades in practice, but finally the tide is gently turning. The extra 2,000 odd calls to say meds of the Christmas and New Year period just a flavour of what's been happening on the ground. GPs <laughs> have their phone data re unanswered practice calls all in the media, I note too. Be careful what you wish for, was my initial thought, as not all practices actually participated in this data sharing. It's a huge issue though, day to day. If it's as busy as normal for any said time of year, then the practice is fully staffed and humming along, fine. As perhaps expected post COVID, things have pretty much gone back to mostly face-to-face -face appointments as the requested format. During COVID, it was hailed as possibly the new way forward in a future method of interaction. Video consultations, virtual stuff, phone discussions, email, all in place of the traditional face-to-face. -face. Well, it hasn't happened. <laughs> it may be inevitable, though, when you look at how folks prefer to seek medical advice. The older generation, whatever age that might be, usually prefer to see a doctor, as often there is a lot to go through. Sometimes medication tweaks, other, well, sundry illnesses popping up and queries, which are sometimes just simply best sorted out face to face. Whilst the younger patients, often glued to their smartphones, well, they're always glued to their smartphones, might prefer not to be sitting in the GP surgery any time soon, so they don't mind video stuff, phone stuff and all the like. Now, the Balasana surgery popped its head above the ramparts, of course, recently. Who knows what the mechanisms in play here are, but as ever, it's likely to be simply be workload versus capacity to cope with it. I can't stress enough how awful this past year has been for many GP practices, basically since the COVID restrictions have lifted. I'm not even hinting here at a sympathy request. It's just been awful for most of us in so many different ways. From the GP work point of view, we've had a huge uncorking of pent-up demand initially. Significant issues then with the hospital's capacity for referrals to be processed, as the waiting list has for many specialties bulged during the various lockdowns. And as they often say, hey... If you and yours have earache, toothache, severe pain or distress, you simply don't care how many others are complaining of similar problems. Like birds in the nest, the noisiest and most wide open beaks, get first dibs at the worms hanging out of their mother's mouths. And so it is in GP practice land, and dental practices, and the rest, I'm sure. GP surgeries can't sim simply, suddenly, put in extra staff. Where do you get them from? More phone lines, where do you get those from? Or staff generally, just like that. While Sir Jonathan Michael's report might suggest more integrated working, and initially anyway sort of regional hub services, which would effectively bring practices together, hence sharing workload, expertise, more specialist teams working together, that's great. Hence, relatively fire-proofing practices from the stress of doctors and nurses retiring, leaving, being on maternity leave or sabbaticals, becoming unwell and thus causing a huge spike in what the remaining staff have to deal with. None of this will happen quickly, though. <laughs> None of this hub stuff is going to happen quickly. Thus, in smaller practices, it may end up all in one or two pairs of hands. That simply isn't going to work for long. That 12-hour day is suddenly seeming like, well, part-time working. We simply do not have on the island at the moment, and the UK in general, a pool of capable replacement GPs or practice nurses that can be slotted in just like that. It may be suitable staff will arrive in due course. Let's hope so. Look at the Snaefell model. Political will was there for that surgery to remain open, faced with huge issues, again, ex-staffing numbers at that time, what at that time were a set of heartbreaking reasons and no doubt Manx care are working very hard to this end but it is stressful for all concerned at times like this but as ever where there's a will there is a way on the other hand the numbers coming through with flu covid strep a infections and dmv are slowly leveling off the days are lengthening time to have a bit of an overhaul of your health status can you look at yourself in the mirror anytime soon and think, woo, who is a healthy looking bod staring back at me? If not, well, join the club. That's normal this time of year. Your diet should be your number one item. 
coupled with, if applicable, alcohol reduction, smoking cessation, I'd be followed by more exercise. Stress reduction, relationship mending, restful sleep, and for many, how to simply deal with all those bills pouring in from heating to tax. Lots to grapple with them. I had a lady in there recently who needed a joint replacement, but would have to lose several stone before it could be achieved. Well, over the last year or so, that's just what she did. Amazing. To her, she recounted just cutting out what this lady called junk food and lots of ultra-processed food and heavily calorie-laden snacks. No additional exercises, the joints wouldn't allow it. Over the year, several stones were dropped, joint replaced, and then she popped to have some updated blood tests from everything from sugar to cholesterol and the like. Her overall cholesterol came down, as you'd expect, but what improved dramatically was what we call the good cholesterol, the HDL. Typically, this stuff is highest in premenopausal exercising ladies with a strong flame history. But by way of a diet alone, it had transformed to that sort of picture, even though this lady was non exercising and postmenopausal. So, even if you, as it stands, are very overweight and fit and it's just an impossible task to get back on track, it simply isn't. Clearly it is, and it can be done. On that very hopeful note, I hope. Until next week. Cheerio.